everyone take the space. And take the space, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's like the most amazing creative agency working across arts and heritage um, with a specific focus on black and multi-ethnic work, on audiences, on working with artists, practitioners, and doing really fantastic things. It's my favorite subject in the world. And so I'm really excited to be here. I have a confession to make. I actually can't say the name of your profession. It comes out really weird, so you are officially the A team. Okay, so I'm just going to refer to it for any stuff. And um, so I'm going to talk in two parts about what I do, what Take the Space does, and then talk about this amazing project, Beachy Head Woman, and how I feel like I just sort of fell into it. Um, so the first part is um, what Take the Space is. Um, I work with black and multi-ethnic audiences. I do, like I've worked in um, culture and diversity for an awfully long time. And um, so I've done stuff across workforce diversity. I've worked with young people. I've worked with between um, the conversation between disability and multi-ethnic um, art practice and all sorts of really fantastically interesting things. And, um, and I work to sort of make um, the black cultural voice present. And in a nutshell, I say it's making space for the voice of Black Britain. Um, so, you know, there's two ways that I do this. And in one is in thought leadership, and the other one is actually in practice. So I just want to sort of go through what that means. Because um, thought leadership is a really weird thing to say that you do because it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but actually, I can't do, I can't do what I do without the investment in thinking, in talking, in conferences, in stats, in reports, in evaluation, in learning, and all of those kinds of things. And I find some of the questions that we have at various things absolutely fascinating, extraordinary. Um, and this was, um, but actually what I want to say is that it's essential. I have to do this work. I have to do this work in order that I can make, make and practice. Um, and in that respect, it's about making sure that the environment of our cultural sector is equipped to be welcoming of folks from all different lifestyles, communities, abilities, gender. It, we have to create that environment and actually the only way we can do it is by doing things, by being active in our diversity and equality thinking. This, uh, this was an event I had in December and it was called an immersive conversation and um, I invited uh, one of our leading um, academics who has run, is running the first PhD in Black Cultural Studies at the University of Nottingham to come and talk with um, some leading cultural commentators and artivists, activists in the arts and we had a conversation, we had an exchange about, of ideas about what it is to be black and British, and it was fascinating. And that's going to be in a series of podcasts on my website, so follow me on Twitter. Shameless. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other areas of work that I've been involved in um, include the What Difference Does Difference Make? project. Again, that is on my website. And that was um, two years ago, it was 40 years since a seminal report written by somebody called Nassim Khan, the late, great Nassim Khan. And she was the first diversity um, officer at Arts Council England. And she wrote this extraordinary report called The Arts Britain Ignores, talking about this whole cultural manifestation from new and diverse communities that wasn't being regarded by the mainstream. And what we did two years ago is we actually looked back and said, well, what difference has difference made to the cultural economy? Loads of cultural commentators um, did some box pops and did some papers and stuff like that. And it's a really interesting um, watch and read. And then prior to that, uh, around 2014, uh, myself and a group of 10 folks, um, uh, black cultural leaders came together and we put together what's called Just Cultural just Culture Manifesto, which was calling for a fair and just cultural landscape. And what we'd done is we'd gathered some statistics, we'd gathered reports, we used Nassim's report, and looked at where we were. And actually what we discovered was in the public, um, publicly sected, speak, public arts sector, that there was a real, um, there was a real dip, actually, in representation, in funding, in workforce, across the board. And we knew from our census figures that the black and multi-ethnic community has grown, 
particularly in the last 10 years, we know that. And so, you know, my head was thinking, well, actually, this community is putting more into the cultural pot than ever before and receiving less than it have, has ever done. And that can't be right. It can't be good for our community. It can't be good for the way we go forward. So we put together a manifesto. It was an advocacy document and it's online and it's, um, it's a really interesting thing because it's sector led. And, it's, and it made a request for what we wanted the cultural landscape to look like and how we might get there. And it covers so many different things. I'm really skipping through this, so apologies that it's going so quick. So that's all the stuff around um, thought leadership. This thing about needing that mindset to enable us to do. Let me show you all of these web things. I can circulate this as we go. So there's the websites. But this is what I really want to do. I have to do that thought leadership stuff. But I want to do, I want to make the work, I want to work with the practitioners, I want to discover stories, I want to do all of these things. Um, but actually sometimes the cultural environment doesn't allow for it. But um, this is an example of um, a, a maker that I've worked with recently. Um, a visual artist called Elsa James, extraordinary artist, and she went into the archives of Essex Record Office and pulled out some stories of um, communities that lived in Essex between the 16th and 19th century and made a response to it. What I love about this piece of work is she's, she's delving right into heritage, she's delving right into archives and coming out with, with a response that actually is going to reach so many different audiences who would have gone, say what? Who are these people that lived here since when? And I really like that we can animate our stories so adventurously if we choose to. So to sum up, I wanted to show you this. This is from my business plan. And I wanted to sum up what my core values are. And you'd expect me to be going, yeah, it's about equality. Yeah, it's about diversity and representation. And all those things are a bit dry. But no, what I'm interested in is authentic story, authentic voice. I'm interested in being curious and playful. I'm interested in the unexpected stories and how we engage with people and all those beautiful things that I believe diversity and equality to be about. But, you know, it starts here. And the outcomes of this, I believe, will be um, leadership that's representative audiences that engage and are resonant with your work and so on and so on and so forth. So I would really recommend that actually as you start your process of whatever it is you will do tomorrow, that you start off with the values of actually what makes your sector so fascinating. So anyway, back to this fabulous story. The beach, I mean, it's in partnership with Eastbourne Heritage who are phenomenal. And I just wanted to talk you through the life cycle of a project because it's fascinating how I arrived at it. Um, and all good projects start with an egg, don't they? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and this particular project started with an egg, post-Brexit being landed on my front door and my husband's van. And a series of racist attacks and incidents that happened, I live in Eastbourne, by the way, a series of racist, the cultural environment seemed to change overnight post-Brexit, and families like mine were a mixed family, were targets. And um, so this egg is happening, and my son comes home from Eastbourne Town Centre and says to me, Mum, I was with my mates, and this guy in his 60s comes up to me and he says to me, why don't you go back to your own country? He's 12. And I was shocked, because actually that's what I had when I was 12, you know, X many years on. So here we are, we're having an egg the egg situation, and me and the old man are sitting watching TV, and this guy is on TV talking about Black Britons. And we're having a cup of tea, and I literally dropped my cup of tea. Because he was talking about the beachy head woman who was literally down the road. The remains of the beachy head woman who is said to be 2,000 years old, her bones were found, just down the road, and at the time, the oldest Black Britain known in the country. So I went and saw Joe at Eastbourne Heritage and uh, Catherine, and said, you know, we've got to talk about this project because this is just up my street. And personally, 
I need this story to be told in my local community. And so Joe was telling me that actually um, he'd done um, some isotope chalk analysis. He knew that um, the beachy head woman would have lived and died um, just here yeah. on the Sussex coast, that she would have eaten well. I don't know how you guys know this from some <laughs> bones. You know, that she would have eaten fish and vegetables. How do you know? But you know, her teeth were in good condition. I was like, what, what, you know? All of this knowledge, it was like a curiosity box being opened. And um, there was, and then he said, do you want to see her? And it still gives me, you know, the tingles. And so he brought this box and I'll never forget it. And I was sitting there in his office and I opened it up and I picked her out and I looked at it. And I had never, ever felt that kind of connection never felt that kind of resonance as I did then. That was a, such a moment. And I remember stroking her hair. I stroked her hair. And I thought to myself, I need to share this. I need to share this experience because it's incredible. So, what are we going to do? This was maybe a year ago. And so I've been working with Joe and the team on thinking about how we might develop the project. And I just wanted to give you an overview of what that might look like. The first two areas, I don't know nothing about that. So the testing, the analysis, the exca excavations, the field work, I'm saying this stuff, <laughs> the A team stuff. <laughs> so that will be really, really where the skills and talent of, of, of Joe and the Eastbourne Heritage team come in. And where I'm really excited to be working is in how we actually tell this story on a national basis, because it's such an important story to tell. And so some of the things we're thinking of is about volunteers. I'm mindful that all across the country, um, there's uh, black heritage groups just down the road in Brighton. There's a 70 strong, Black, and, um, black Heritage Group led by extraordinary folks, and um, it's replicated around the country. There's no end of communities that are interested in finding out more about heritage. Where it doesn't transfer to, as we know, and as, as we're alluding to in this conversation, is in the workforce. Um, so there is a, there is a, there's an opportunity, isn't there, between those who are interested in and those wanting maybe a career or inspiring the next generation of folks to be interested in the 18's work. We're thinking of doing an, an A training bursary. I'm so not saying that word. <laughs> it's just not going to do it. Right. No! <laughs> to archaeologists. <laughs> so you guys, <laughs> so you guys, so we were thinking about the potential for somebody, because what I've read, and I don't know if it's still true, that there's 99% of your workforce that is white. And actually, what I read in a report digging diversity was that there is a number of people of color who do train. So is there, there's questions, isn't there? There's a question about what happens after they stop training, that they don't get these employment opportunities. Is that a structural issue? Is that an issue around race? Is there a question about what about retention, that some people are recruited but don't get ret retained. And these are the kinds of things that actually stats can show you. Um, we would like to run um, a positive action program that enables somebody who's thinking, perhaps, of getting into the industry and doesn't know the opportunities that exist. We're thinking maybe we can do something for somebody that's recently graduated and needs to strengthen their CV, or so on and so on and so forth. Um, for my part, it would be really fantastic to have somebody with those skill sets, with a mindset and a perspective that will um, encourage it to be that authentic voice, which is what I'm so desperately wanting to hear. Um, but I think that that's a really important area. I, I, I need figures from the last year in order to deliver this particular element of work, because under the... Um, the Equality Act guidelines, you have to have, in order to do a specific and targeted focused piece of work around um, underrepresentation, you need to have the figures from the year before. Sorry, that's my piece. <laughs>
And the last thing is the salon in the salon. I just want to, what I heard, and you can tell me if this is true or not, is that in Roman times, women just had funky hairdos. <laughs> and this is what I'm hearing. And I just thought, I want to do that. Because actually, I wonder what beachy head woman's hair would have looked like. I wonder who would have looked after it. What I do know is that Afrocones were present in Roman times, but there is no way an Afrocone is coming near an Afro hair without product, because this sea air dries <laughs> your hair out. Seriously, it dries out so much. And we were talking, I was talking to somebody, maybe, that, maybe she would have used olive oil, but nobody wants to smell like olive oil. So, you know, there's some questions that want to be answered, and they're really fun, they're really playful, and they're really curious. So, um, so much opportunity. So my last bit is, is back to you, really. Just going to find out. My last bit is back to you about the cultural impact of archaeology, specifically at this time where we have Bandon Lady of York, we have the beautiful Beachy Head Lady, we obviously have Cheddar Gorge Man, which has just opened up so many questions and so much. Um, discussion points, so much to chew over, and I personally find that so exciting. Um, and I, I, I googled what was the um, main attributes of being an A, your profession, and this is what it came up with. And I thought that was pretty good. Curiosity, discovery, fact. Fact, I love fact. A thirst for knowledge, critical thinking. All those things actually perfectly align itself with these kinds of projects. And um, personally, and I, I really wanted to say to my son something profound when that guy said, why don't you go back to your own country? And this project is my way of responding to him and others who are receiving the kind of nightmarish 70s racism that's just not, not on. But I want them to be able to say, well, you know, Maybe, um, maybe you need to know that there was folks of African descent in Roman times, and maybe if we can equip folks with knowledge, it would make for a better place.